Joining us now, former Obama campaign advisor and Sirius XM host, Amisha Cross, also with us, former Republican congressman, senior advisor of our Republican legacy, Charlie Dent. Uh, Amisha, 25 days out, the race extremely close in every battleground state that could ultimately decide the election. What are the biggest red flags jumping out if you are in the Harris campaign today? I think that you have to be looking at the, the turnout. I mean, GOTV is going to be the name of the game here. You're going to have to get the tried and true Democrat, Democratic base, but you're also going to have to turn out some of those moderate voters, some of those voters who would have voted for Nikki Haley, um, the individuals who are more akin to listen to the former um, Trump advisors and former Trump campaign officials and others who have now come out against him. I think that those Republicans might be up for grabs in certain areas. But to be honest, this is a case of a get out the vote GOTV uh, old style guerrilla warfare for lack of a better term type of election cycle where she's going to have to get those individuals who have tuned out politics those individuals who feel as though this economy has not worked for them the buy-in into what that opportunity economy means the buy-in into um, housing affordability and her plans towards that and being a first-time homeowner what that actually means uh, money in people's wallets being able to afford groceries being able to afford electricity costs Childcare, things like that. It's got to be a bread and butter campaign around the economic issues that matter to everyday Americans. That's what she's going to have to nail in on in these battleground states. And Charlie, just going off this Wall Street Journal polling, I mean, if the vice president wins the states where she leads, and these are just really tight leads, she would technically win a majority in the Electoral College. But with these numbers being as close as they are, I'm just wondering, Charlie, it's very clear that these polls aren't really telling us anything other than it's really tight, right? You can't say, oh, this is the person who's going to win. But why do you think things are so tight? Well, because the country is so d bitterly divided and polarized. I think that's why this race is fundamentally so tight. And the other thing I would just mention about these polls, you know, these battleground state polls, we saw in 2016 and 2020 that Donald Trump performed better than those polls suggested at the time, significantly. And in 2022, we saw, in a non-presidential year, we saw Democrats perform much better than the polls suggested at the time. So I, I am not sure what to make out of these polls today. And this, of course, is the first presidential election uh, post-Dobbs. Uh, so we'll see how that also plays into this. But sitting here in Pennsylvania, I can tell you, this is so tight. I'm, I'm sitting in Allentown, Pennsylvania. This is the swingiest of swing congressional districts in the Commonwealth, maybe the country. We just had Speaker Johnson and Hakeem Jeffries here yesterday. We've had all the presidential candidates running through here. I mean, this is just nonstop. I have 50 pieces of mail at my house that I've accumulated over the last two weeks, political mail. And so it's so bitterly divided. I don't know. You know it, look, I think I think it's correct to, us, to assess that this is going to be a turnout election at the end of the day. Who can get their voters out? Harris might have a slight edge there because she's got a lot of energy and enthusiasm and money behind her. And I think Trump's campaign is, doesn't have as good an organizational ground game at this point. And they're spending a lot more time on election security, perhaps, than on GOTV efforts, get out the vote efforts. So maybe she has the slightest of edges. But boy, if anybody tells you they know how this is going to turn out, they, I think they're fooling you. Yeah. And I mean, as far as the get out the vote campaigns, right? Uh, Amisha, I want to talk about one of the issues that uh, some point to, which is the vice president's problem with, with black male voters. Here's former President Obama in Pittsburgh yesterday talking about that. We have not yet seen the same kinds of energy and turnout in all quarters of our neighborhoods and communities as we saw when I was running. That seems to be more pronounced with the brothers. You're thinking about sitting out or even supporting somebody who has a history of denigrating you because you think that's a, a sign of strength because that's what being a man is. Put women down? That's not acceptable. Amisha, I'm just, uh, first of all, I mean, is everybody buying into the narrative that the vice president has a black male problem? 
I think if people live in the internet and don't get off of it, possibly so. But that is something that has been trafficked in by Republicans and something that has taken off online for now multiple election cycles. We heard it in 2016, it didn't pan out. We've heard it in every election cycle since. My frustration is that the weight of democracy has been carried on the backs of black men and women since the dawn of this country. And at the end of the day, the protection of democracy and everything therein has always been something we have fought for, be it whether it's through civil rights or other means within our communities. Black men vote in lockstep with black women with maybe a three percentage difference. That is something that I think matters. Um, the Democratic Party knows that they can count on and have long counted on the black vote, largely because they've been the party that has fought to protect civil rights. I think that at this point, the, the pushback that I largely have on this is that white women have for a very long time been the harbingers and the protectors of white supremacy. They have stood by, they have stood back and stood by for far too long and have not been given that, that talking to that they deserve. Black men are not the people who are creating the hurdles for Kamala Harris here. Is misogyny a thing in America? Absolutely. And we see in the former commander in chief in Donald Trump that he's running on that. He could care less about the woman vote. Having a woman run presents its own level of difficulties because of the historic relevance of, of, of the hurdles that women have faced across this country, particularly a woman of color. But make no mistake, black men are invested in this campaign and this cycle, and they are not going to be the people who are hallmarking the stock for Kamala Harris. And it is disingenuous for anyone to say that they will be. Misha Cross and Charlie Dent, thank you both so very much.